Okay, now we're going to get into uh, the second half of 1 John 4. And this is really why so many people think that this book or letter is about how to love people. You know, this is the love letter. Um, but really, as we'll see, it is actually about God's love for us, being perfected in his love, dwelling in his love, recognizing that we are saved, and recognizing brethren. In contrast to those who say they love God, but show that they don't because they hate the brethren. Again, we're talking about Cain. Um, so, let me get back to it, sorry. Uh, the, the chapter ends with verse 21. This is the commandment we have from him that he love he who loves God love his brother also. Now, and then verse 20, look at this. If a man say, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he that loves not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? So this is another one of the, if we say, or if a man say. Again, in 1 John, all the things where it says, if someone says, it turns out they're a liar. <laughs> if they say they have fellowship with God but walk in darkness, they're a liar. And what is it to walk in darkness? They hate the brethren. That's in the first chapter. If they say they have no sin, they're a liar and the truth is not in them. The two are connected because we're getting to, uh, and that's in chapter 1 too, but the two are connected because love eventually is recognizing God's way of justifying sinners and recognizing who is our brother. Um, okay, so here we have a man saying that he loves God. But as we'll see, what is, not re what is required of us is not that we love God. In 1 John, it's not that we love God, but that God loved us and gave his son for us to be a propitiation for our sins and that we may live through him. And we are to dwell in that love. Now, the old commandment under the law was love God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, um, and love your neighbor as yourself. But the new commandment, which John talks about that he says is true in Christ and in you because the darkness is past and the true light now shines, is that we would believe in Jesus Christ and love one another. And the one another doesn't refer to your neighbor in the world, actually. It's referring to the brothers, which have the eternal life. They're brothers because they're born of God. Um, in the New Testament, when we see brothers, we're talking about the sons of God who have his life. And in John, at the end of John, when Jesus told Mary, don't touch me, I've got to go to my heaven, uh, father after his resurrection. He had to go present his blood, right? Um, so he had a high priestly duty to accomplish. But he told Mary, go and tell my brothers that I ascend to my father and your father, my God and your God. That was a new statement based on his resurrection, that they had been made brothers. And we're all brothers of Christ and co-heirs together with him because we have his life. When we get born of the Spirit, when we get born of God, we receive his life and become members of his household, members of his family. And so the old commandment was for slaves. Old commandment was under the law, or was the law, was given at Sinai, and we've been talking about Sinai versus Zion. And according to Gal uh, Galatians uh, 4, Sinai is for slaves. It begets slaves, engenders children unto bondage. And at Sinai, there's these outward commands written on tablets of stone. And those stone tablets are called a in 2 Corinthians 3, a ministry of condemnation and death. They're called the letter. And they kill. They did not bring life, nor did they justify. Instead, they reveal sin. 
They don't even reveal the righteousness of God, which is what we think, but it, they reveal the wrath of God from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness. They actually reveal the state of man. They are a diagnosis of man's fallen condition, not a recommendation for man to live. Um, and there's many people that are confused about that. They think that the Christian life, once they get justified by believing in the blood, um, is to keep the law as a rule of life. But that changes the function of the law and takes it out of its place as a ministry of condemnation and death, cursing, and wrath. And 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 it it's based on a deception that you think that now you can keep the law. Which that then, you know, begs the question, if you could keep the law, why did Christ die? You know, if ju if justification or righteousness came through the law, Christ died in vain. Your flesh is condemned to the cross and cannot do what the law describes. And what's the two great commandments? Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your might, and love your neighbor as yourself. And man can't do either. Um, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength means with the entirety of your being, without ceasing, forever because if you break it in one point you've broken the whole thing and if you've broken it for a moment you've broken the whole thing when you fall in you know from perfection you've fallen short of the glory of god and perfection is the standard and perfection is jesus christ now jesus christ is the one who loves the father with the entirety of his being and has from eternity to eternity he dwells in the bosom of the father and uh, what he offers is not to give you the ability to love God with all your heart, soul, and strength, mind, and, you know, by yourself, but to give you the spirit of the Son crying, Abba, Father, in your heart, and to shed the love of God abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit, which is given to us, and to make Christ, for Christ to make his home in your heart. And to cause you to partake of the fellowship of the Father and the Son. And that the love that the Father has for the Son would be in you. And the love of the Son for the Father be in you. And you actually participate in that love as a fellowship by the Spirit. The Spirit is that love. It's their relationship, which is the eternal life. Uh... And that's what God wanted to put, put, put in us through regeneration. Now, some people who are believers say, well, I'm born again, so actually I do love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength because I'm under the new, I, I'm under the new covenant. And he said he'd write my law in his my, mind and my heart. But that's erroneous because Christians are not under the new covenant. That is given specifically for Israel and will be for their time as mortals during the millennium to participate in a priesthood without apostatizing. God says, I'll put a new heart and a new spirit in them. I'll put my spirit in them. I will wash them from all their filthiness. I will cause them to walk in my ways. And they shall not depart from him. And he said, I'll cause them to walk in my statutes and ordinances. And it won't be like the covenant which I gave to their fathers, which they broke. But I will dwell in them and cause them to walk in my ways. Um, this is something that we haven't seen yet. First of all, the new covenant is a replacement for what's called the old covenant. What's the old covenant? Moses. And both 2 Corinthians and Hebrews makes that real clear that the first covenant, or the old covenant... The one that's waxing old and passing away, which is a ministry of condemnation and death, and which is the one that they broke, which had the moral law and the feasts, um, and it was their failure to keep that covenant that was the reason for their departure from the land again and again and again, for the destruction of the temple and for the judgments during the Old Testament times. They couldn't keep it. They continually apostatized. Why? Because they were in the flesh and they had the heart, a heart of stone. And the flesh can't keep the law of God. Just cannot, right? So the old covenant is Moses. Now Galatians tells us that 
Mo the Mosaic Covenant, or the Old Covenant, was given 400 years after the Abrahamic Covenant and can't disannul the inheritance that was guaranteed by the Abrahamic Covenant or add conditions to it to make it of no effect. So even though individuals may experience part of Israel's national chastisement because the nation was given the law, and for their failure to keep it, they were often put in situations where they didn't even have the ability to keep it anymore. Like if you were in Babylonian uh, captivity, you couldn't keep the law because there was no priesthood. There was no temple. There were no sacrifices. All that's part of the law. And yet individuals were still justified by faith. Like Daniel, uh, Meshach, Abednego, Nehemiah, Esther. Why were they justified by faith? Because of Abraham's covenant. Their inheritance is secure. And God will raise them from the dead so that they can dwell in their land as God promised them. Because the Abrahamic covenant has no conditions. And it doesn't involve two parties. It involves one party, God himself. It is a covenant between the Father and the Son. And it's called the everlasting covenant. So a lot of times when I say we're not under the new covenant, people will say, well, what about the blood of the new covenant? What's the blood of the new and everlasting covenant? And that it's actually two covenants. The everlasting covenant is the covenant between the Father and the Son that makes Christ the shepherd of the sheep and also guarantees the inheritance to Christ. He makes him heirs of all the covenants and promises. And he secured it with his own blood. Okay, that is the covenant that guarantees really our eternal life um, and the forgiveness of our sins. And we partake of that inheritance, according to Galatians 3, by being baptized into Christ. Um, he says, you see, we were as Gentiles, we were strangers from the covenants of promise, right? We had no part in any of it. We didn't have any part in the covenant that God made with Abraham for, I'm sorry, with Moses 400 years after he made the everlasting covenant, when he put Abraham to sleep and passed through the pieces as of the animals as the oven and the torch, uh, which secured our inheritance, secured the inheritance, right? Actually, it secured the inheritance for the seed, according to Galatians 3, and that seed is Christ. And according to Galatians 3, we Gentiles and the Jews have been baptized into Christ, and have put them on. And because of that, we have a new relationship with Abraham and our heirs with Christ, according to the Abrahamic covenant. We are blessed with faithful Abraham because of our relationship with Christ. See, as a Gentile, I have no relationship. Well, actually, genetically, I'm Jewish. But as a Gentile, I would have no relationship with Abraham. And the Jews do, by faith, have a relationship with Abraham. But in Christ, if you're a Jew and you get saved, you get transferred out of the Adamic human race and out of Israel, baptized into the death of Christ, and into what's called the new man, in which there is no Jew nor Greek, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. It's a new man. And we, as Gentiles and Jews in the church age, are baptized into this person and we've put them on. And so we all have an equal relationship with Abraham that's divorced from the promise of the land. And is connected to Christ and the promise of the Spirit. So he says, Christ became a curse for us in Galatians 3. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through faith. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit. And Jews and Gentiles who are saved in this time become members of the body of Christ. They're baptized into Christ and they get a new relationship to Abraham. The Gentiles never had one. The Jews used to have one according to the flesh. But if they're members of the body of Christ, that relationship is absolved. Uh, dissolved, I'm sorry, annulled. And a new relationship is established, which is that they are in Christ, who is the seed of Abraham, as members of the new man of the body of Christ, which is an exalted entity that has a more glorious trajectory than earthly Israel. And that is to be conformed to the image of son, the Son and to reign with him as kings and priests during the millennium as glorious, resurrected, 
ambassadors of Christ and members of his body and part of his bride. They're taken out of Jew and Gentile and put into Christ. And so what we have, we are heirs. We are not partakers of a covenant. God didn't make a covenant with you. He doesn't have a covenant with you where you have to keep certain parts and he keeps certain parts. No, Christ keeps it all. And what he is, is the mediator of a testament. I went over this in Hebrews, but what it presents is the old covenant passed away and there is a new covenant for Israel that will be inaugurated for the nation when they inherit their land, which will be the time of the millennium. That's what Jesus is coming back for, is to establish uh, his people in their land. He's going to open their graves and also the mortals that live are going to inherit uh, their land. And that will be the millennium, and their king will reign. And for that, because they will keep it, the mortals, because they will keep God's ways for a thousand years in the land as mortals, that God is going to make a new covenant with them to replace the old covenant. It's with the house of Israel. Um, and he's going to put his laws in their heart. And in their mind, he's going to write them. And he's going to put a new heart in them. Take away the heart of stone, put them in a new heart. And put his spirit in them and give them a new spirit and cause them to walk in his way so that they will not depart from them. They will never backslide. They will have holiness written on their foreheads. They will be holy through and through in a way that we've never seen among humans except Jesus Christ. And it will be a direct working of God in them that will enable this for a thousand years. And that will be how they fulfill their obligations in, a, in the new covenant, which is really God fulfilling those obligations, that allows them to stay in their land and gives them all the blessings that they never could fully obtain under the first covenant. Remember, the first covenant had all kinds of blessings. If you hear my word, you'll be, you know, if you, if you do these things, you'll be blessed in the city and blessed in the field, blessed going in and blessed going out and blessed in the basket in the store, the head only and not the tail, above only and not beneath. But if you don't, then all these curses will fall on you. And Israel's history has been intermittent blessings with mostly curses. And especially during the Holocaust, we saw a lot of the curses described in Deuteronomy 28 fall on that nation. And all of that is for the nation. Individuals are still justified by faith, and even if they're part of the nation during a time of chastisement, if they die and they believe in the promise of the seed of the woman and the seed of Abraham and the seed of David and believe in justification by blood, they will be resurrected into their land to inherit it in that day. And that uh, is called the remnant, according to Romans 11. They're the remnant, a believing remnant. Not all of Israel always believed, but there was a believing remnant. Today there is a believing remnant, but they're part of the body of Christ. A Jewish believer becomes cut out of their genetic relationship to Abraham and baptized into Christ, and his relationship to Abraham is reckoned to them so that they become co-heirs of the New Testament, which again is not a covenant. And again, Hebrews talks about the new covenant for Israel, but then it says that Christ is the mediator of the new testament, or he's the testator. The death of the testator has occurred, and now there is a new testament. And that testament is an inheritance for the heirs who are baptized into Christ. So we have a position as heirs. The, test, uh, the testator has already occurred. Now you can be a good heir or a bad heir, and it doesn't matter, you're an heir. If somebody dies and has bequeathed an inheritance to you, you receive it regardless of how good you are, unless there's terms and conditions in it. But there, the only term and condition we have is to believe in Jesus Christ, which is the new commandment. Now, the old commandment had laws, or the old covenant. They had to supposedly love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? And love their neighbor as themselves. Well, for us, there's a new commandment, which is true in Christ and also in us. Why? Because we are the sons of God. The darkness has passed. We've been regenerated and we have a new life, which is the life of Jesus Christ himself. And this life is the person who loves God with the entirety of his being, nonstop, 
without ceasing forever. His love goes up as a fragrance before the Father. And we've talked about that many times, that the burnt offering typifies this aspect of him, him giving himself to the Father in love for the Father's satisfaction. And when we got baptized into Christ, we were made, we were put in the middle of a flow between the Father and the Son called the Fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And it is that love that is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit through knowledge. See, the spirituality we have is very different than what the Israelites will have under the new covenant. We are heirs of the everlasting covenant. And yes, that blood secured our forgiveness. That blood also secured the forgiveness of the nation, the sins of the nation Israel. That's, that's, that's something slightly different. The new covenant is contained in the everlasting covenant. Okay, Christ is the mediator of both. He's the one with whom both are established. He's the one who's going to really fulfill both. But we don't have a part in the new covenant. Our part is in the everlasting covenant that makes him the shepherd of the sheep, according to Hebrews 13, to lead us into glory and guarantees that he will lose none of us. It's that covenant, I believe, that made him the high priest after a new order of Melchizedek where he gives himself to us as bread and wine. I, I know this is very complicated. You may need to listen to this again if you've never heard it. Um, I have a book that's in my library. It's, it's just three or four messages called The Distinctions Between the New Covenant and the New Testament. And it's really important that we understand this because the New Covenant is a backdoor for legalism. Through it, Christians say they love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Why? Because they think they are under the new covenant. And it's that they believe God's laws have written, been written in their heart and mind, which is not what we have. Okay, that's what Israel will have. What do we have? We have our, uh, something higher that manifests itself in a less glorious way now, but will be more glorious in the age to come. Because it's a treasure in an earthen vessel. The treasure is Christ as the life-giving spirit who regenerated our, our human spirit. And my spirit and the Lord's spirit have become one. He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit. That is the eternal life. That is the fountain of living water installed in the center of my being. And Christ flows through that fountain. He springs up onto everlasting life through that fountain that's been installed in me, my spirit. Christ in my spirit. Christ as life, Jesus Christ. And I'm a partaker of him. I'm a member of his body. And he is supplying me with the bountiful supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ so that I could learn to live Christ, which is a, to which is a word that Paul uses that has nothing to do with anything in the new covenant. And gain Christ, according to Philippians 3. We pursue him that we may gain him. And we talked about this in the Second Corinthians study that our spirituality is something called gaining Christ. And it's also in the Philippians study in chapter 3. But gaining Christ means that there is a weight of glory being wrought into me as I actually pursue him and lay hold of him and know him. It's through the knowledge of him. As I go to know him in the excellency, if I, as I count everything as lost on account of the excellency of of the knowledge of Christ um, and seek to know him and pursue to know him in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his sufferings and to be conformed to his death. And I lay hold of him so that the life of Jesus it can be manifested in me. And Paul says in Philippians 1, uh, this shall turn out to my salvation through your petition and the bountiful supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ that as always, so now, uh, Christ will be magnified in my body with all boldness, whether life through life or through death, for to me to live is Christ. We have this unique kind of spirituality called living Christ, gaining Christ, which is a hidden weight of eternal glory in us, which is called the treasure, and yet we have it in an earthen vessel. So we still have uh, the humanity that has not really been transformed see the new t covenant transforms their humanity it puts a new heart in them and writes the law of god in their heart and mind and his spirit in them causes them to walk in his ways 
so that they express something in their physical bodies, spiritually speaking, that is much higher than in some way in terms of expression than what we have available to us. And the reason it's so important to understand this distinction again is because most of the inner life people like Andrew Murray, a lot of the great spiritual writers made the mistake of assuming we were under the new covenant and therefore presented a spirituality that was not a matter of gaining Christ, but set expectations on law keeping. You know, God wrote his law in my heart and mind. And so therefore I should have a certain kind of life and I should love God with all my heart and there should be an un unremittent fellowship. And there's no allowance for weakness. There's no allowance for carnality. There's no allowance for uh, backsliding or flesh, okay? Which are all possibilities in the Christian life uh, and will not be under the new covenant because God will cause them to walk in his ways. No, in the New Testament, what we see is an opportunity. Christ is presented as a free gift, and you can have as much as you want. He's an inheritance. You can enjoy as much as you want. And however much of him you enjoy will transform you. Okay? It will have an effect on your living. But it's incremental. The New Covenant is absolute. It's be perfect so because your Father is perfect. It's the Sermon on the Mount, lived out by God's power. Okay, not in bits and pieces, not five minutes at a time, not a life full of repenting because of all the times you break the law, but actually keeping the law, uh, not by your power. It'll be by grace during that time. It's a spirit of grace and supplications, according to Zechariah, that we pour out on them, that'll wash them and make them new. But we didn't quite have that. We have our spirit, which is a beachhead for Christ. Who lives in us and then we have an earthen vessel which is to some degree transformed and that has to do with the renewing of the mind through the knowledge of Christ we grow in the knowledge of Christ which is the knowledge of his love for us his love for God and God's love for him and God's love for us it's a participation in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and we, have to, we still have the law of sin in our members, and we need to have our vile bodies transfigured for that reason. And we're told to put to death our members which are on the earth. They want to do that in the New Testament, the New Covenant, sorry. That I believe that that per sin nature is going to be completely dealt with through the New Covenant. Whereas with us, we still have a sin nature. We have a law of sin operating in our members, and we have to learn to mortify the deeds of our body by setting our mind on the things of the Spirit. And there's all kinds of admonitions and warnings in the New Testament letters that prove that life of mortals on this side, who are members of the body of Christ, can be really messy. Corinth is the example. You won't see a situation like Corinth during the millennium for the Jews. <laughs> okay, that Why? Because their spirituality will manifest itself in perfection. Our spirituality manifests itself in weakness. We have a different spirituality. We have the caring about in our body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in us, and God leading us through all kinds of afflictions and troubles so that we can partake of the comforts of God and the chastisements of God and the discipline of God that is the inheritance of sons that he's training to express Christ. Now, ultimately, that will be manifested in a greater degree of glory. He says, the, we're not, uh, the momentary light afflictions of this life are not worthy to be compared to the exceeding weight of eternal glory that is wrought in us. See, their spirituality will be glorious in their mortal flesh under the new covenant. But when we enter the millennium, we'll be in resurrection, conformed to the image of Christ. That's when we will really be manifested. Like Colossians says, you know, if you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Uh, set your mind on the things above and not on the earth beneath, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is manifested, then you will be manifested with him in glory. And First John says something similar, that, beloved, we are now, what manner of love is this, that God has called us the sons of God? And so we are. Beloved, now we are the sons of God, though it does not yet manifest what we shall be. But we know that when we see him, we shall be as him. And for that reason, the world doesn't recognize us. 
and Cain hates us, right? So we ha- are in this in-between time where we're in the church age as members of the body of Christ and our glory will not be revealed until the next age. And we have a portion of suffering and filling up in our body the afflictions of Christ for his body's sake and our ministry and our serving is in a time where it is characterized by misunderstandings and attacks and wrestling with principalities and our own weakness and foolishness. And yet, through it all, Christ, uh, the knowledge of Christ is being diffused as a fragrance unto God in us, in these earthen vessels that he's gained. He's leading us in his triumph. The angels can see it, we can't. It is a hidden glory in this age. Again, the new covenant is a revealed kind of spirituality where they're perfect. All the nations will come to them to learn of them. They'll be so spiritual, you know. But we'll be in glory. I mean, we will be even that much more, you know. But in this age, our portion is the sufferings of Christ. Their portion during that age will be the blessings of the new covenant. They're not going to know anything about suffering in that time. They've experienced it already in this time. If they get transferred into the next, they survive the tribulation and make it as mortals into that age. They'll receive the new covenant, and then they won't know sorrow ever again. But they'll be mortals. It's very, it's very different. Okay. So you say, why is he saying all this? Well, because this people who read this thinking that they're under the new covenant think that the new commandment is to love God. Somehow they got the idea that it says to love God, and it doesn't. (laughs) It says, if we say we love God and hate his brother, he's a liar. There are people who boast in loving God. Now, what I said about the new covenant is that people who think of it, it, uh, they're under it, it tends to be a backdoor for legalism, and it's a haven for legalists. There are many who take the way of Cain who also think they're under the new covenant, and think they love God, and yet hate their brother. And these are the exact kind of people he's talking about. He's talking about people who boast in their love for God as their spirituality. But guess what? None of us loves God the way the old commandment described, or the way Jesus Christ does. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with the entirety of your being, unceasing, without stop, forever, amen. You might love God for five minutes at a time, maybe even (laughs) ten, maybe a whole day. But Jesus said, I do nothing except that which is for the glory of the Father. I only seek to please him. Everything I do comes out from him, and everything I do is for him. And that was, you know, the burnt offering was opened up before God. It was an offering just for God. It's the basis for all the other offerings. Okay. The sin offering is the one we're familiar with. It takes away our sins. But there was another offering called the burnt offering, which was exclusively for God. And the burnt offering was opened up. Uh, the head part, everything was washed. The kidneys, the inward parts, everything was put on the table separately for God to inspect. And it was burned as a fragrance to God. And when Paul says, we are a sweet fragrance of Christ unto God in those, you know, uh, in every place, He's talking about the burnt offering. He mentions the burnt offering quite a few times in his epistles. Uh, That there's a fragrance of Christ that goes up. That's why we're pleasing to God. That's why we're acceptable to him. Because, see, this is the beloved son of God who could survive the father's inspection. There's no fault in him. His, His inward parts being opened up and displayed before God on that altar meant that whether it was in his feelings or his affections or his thoughts or his strength or his inward parts, they were found to be fully acceptable before God without spot. And it was on the basis of the burnt offering that all the other offerings were accepted. The burnt offering had to be offered first, and then the blood of the burnt offering was sprinkled on the altar seven times, and then the altar was holy. And because the altar was holy due to the blood of the offering, the burnt offering, the other offerings were accepted. That's why the sin offering works, is because Christ is that righteous and holy before God. He loves God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. Do you? It's ridiculous that anybody would say they did. And I have a playlist called The Love Teachings That Ticked Everybody Off. 
When I was dealing with the Lord Chippers last year, I said, I did a couple messages saying, look, you don't love God. I'm not saying you can't love God. I'm not saying you shouldn't love God. I'm saying you don't. <laughs> I was pretty strong about it. And people who were supposedly grace got all offended about that. Why? Because they thought that their righteousness consisted of loving God with all their heart, and they insisted that they did. And in their offense that I said, you don't, they revealed that they hate the brethren. So they started doubling down and having all kinds of nasty dreams about me and prophesying evil things about me. And now there's a crowd of pitchforks that have been gathered from channel to channel, hundreds of them, that all can't stand me and think I'm a demon. And the root of it is some people got offended over that teaching. It's really amazing. But that crowd supposedly believes the gospel of grace and yet can't recognize a brother. They say I'm not saved. They say they've had dreams and prophecies that tell that I'm not saved, which means that they're taking the way of Cain and not recognizing me by my testimony, you know. Um, and their hatred is just unbounded, yet they say they love God. And when you ask them about their love for God, they point to the new covenant. So they're doctrinally in error all, all through and through. Not only do they take the way of Cain, but they think that we're under the new covenant. There are Jews who say they are Jews, but are not, but do lie. That's one example where you appropriate something that is Jewish to the church and you mix those distinctions that where they need to be kept separate, you know. Um, and they reveal ultimately that they don't believe the gospel the same way I do because they believe they're fruit inspectors. They believe certain kind of fruit shows that you're saved. So, that, so it's a mess, okay? Uh, and if you know some of them and you're, and you're offended that I say that, I'm sorry. But this teaching about love in 1 John is based on a new reality. It's based on the fact that Christ is in us and there's a new commandment, which is not love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, but love, but I'm sorry, and love your neighbor as yourself, but believe on Jesus Christ and love one another. And it's love the brothers. And brothers means regenerated. This is all based on life. And that's why he says, I think in chapter 2 we saw, he says that this is the new commandment, which is true in Christ as it is also in you, because the darkness passes and the true light shines. This is not a teaching on how to love. This is a acknowledgement of what is true of the sons of God in contrast to what is true of false prophets, antichrist, cane walkers, murderers who walk in darkness. And he's making it real clear that these people say they love God, but they show that they don't because they hate the brethren. See, they seem so spiritual. These false prophets that went out from us, that they're of the world, the world hears them. They don't hear us. They reject us. They say we're not the sons of God. They say we're not saved. They say the blood is not enough. You have to show your works. They offer the fruit of the ground, which is really what they're calling the fruit of the spirit. It's just the fruit of the cursed ground. You know, these people who say they love God so much, some of them, when they were debating with me about it last year, said, I've loved God with all my life. Before I was even saved, when I thought he was sending me to hell, I loved God. What, do you think that's an offering? Because if it is, you are Cain. You are offering the cursed ground. Your flesh is cursed. In, in, in the old creation. God's done with it. And this, really, the root of it is they're enemies of the cross of Christ. They will, you'll never hear them say that they were crucified with Christ. They don't believe in that. Or they don't like it. Or they don't talk about it. Instead, they talk about how much they love God. <laughs> while showing how much they hate the brethren. Um, or at least one brother. You know, <laughs> They like the ones that flatter them as the, these false prophets. Um, anyway, he says, so we, we, we left off last message. We are of God. Uh, he that knows God hears us. He that does not of God hears not us. And he's talking about the recognizing the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And the spirit of error basically rejects the work of Christ. They may say he's God. They may say he's man, but they won't say he's Jesus Christ come in the flesh, which means he's God who came in the flesh and he's the Christ, which means he accomplished the work. He said, no, I know he knows that he, he calls him Jesus Christ. No, he denies that the work that Christ finished is finished and says that your works are required instead or in addition to. 
That is a denial of Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, who accomplished the work in the flesh and comes in the flesh. And later we'll see, I think it's in 1 John 5, that he comes by water and by blood. When you say he comes in the flesh, you have to acknowledge that he became a man and he came by blood and what the blood secures, which is propitiation for our sins. And how do we recognize the spirit of truth and spirit of error? The spirit of error is totally does not have that confession. And the spirit of truth laser sharp focuses on this profession. So I said, man, you always say, you're always teaching the same things pretty much, but it's always different, like different words, but it's the same thing. Yeah, because our confession is Jesus Christ and him crucified. I'm determined to know nothing among you but Jesus and him crucified, like Paul said. And uh, the blood of Jesus is my only way to stand before God. And so I have nothing else to talk about, you know. Uh, he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Okay. He that loves not knows not God, for God is love. See, so you close the Bible, you read that alone, you say, oh my gosh, I don't love. That means I'm not born of God. And you turn it into a litmus test. You say, this is called backloading, where you say, I thought I believed the gospel, but maybe I don't because I don't have this love. I don't love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Well, at least you're honest. That's better than these people who think that they're under the new covenant and think they do. Uh... But that's not what he's saying. Let's read on. In this was manifested the love of God towards us, because God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Wait a second, I thought we were supposed to live before God. No, you live in Christ. Christ lives before God. You are baptized into his death, and you are dead, and Christ is your life. I'm crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, right? The life I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. What? Loved me and gave himself for me. How did he love me? Is it because I loved him? Well, not according to Romans 5. Romans 5 said, And this was God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were weak, Christ died for his enemies. While we were ungodly, Christ died for us. What does it mean to be sinners? It means we were lawbreakers, we broke all the laws, including love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? In fact, we were children of wrath by nature. We were alienated in our mind through wicked works. Our carnal mind was hostile towards God. Uh, we walked according to the course of this world, according to the spirit that operates in the sons of disobedience. We were completely lost. And God commended his love in that while we were in that condition, Christ died for us. Same thing here. And this was manifested, the love of God towards us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world, that we should live for him by loving him with all of our strength, might, soul, and strength. No, <laughs> that we might live through him. Not live for him, but live through him. He is our life. Here in his love, okay, here's the definition, because I'm still wondering if I love God, and it's, I need to love God. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, if you say you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your brother as yourself, then you are saying you don't sin, because that is the sum of the law. And all sin is the transgression of the law. He told us that already, or is also the transgression of the law. See, there's a group of people that say they don't sin. They're the same people that say they walk in the light and have fellowship with God. And they say they love God. And yet they reveal that they don't because they hate the brethren. They say they have no sin. They say they love God. They keep, they, they, they keep the commandments perfectly, which means they love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love the neighbor as themselves. Which is the sum of the law. Jesus said these are the two the greatest commandments on which the law and the prophets hang. They lie. The truth is not in them, if that's what they say. And they reveal that they're liars in their hatred for the brother and refusing to recognize. Anytime you find someone who's willing to go on a campaign to try to prove that somebody else is not saved, who has the profession and has the gospel, that is someone who... <laughs> has problems. And it's just so ironic that 
those people say they love God. I mean, they boast in it. It's a ridiculous. Okay, here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. This is the love that he's talking about. He's not talking about our love. He's talking about God's love. To dwell in love and be born of him, to dwell in God and to be born of him means you have his love because you have his life. And it's not because we're partakers of the new covenant where he writes his law and therefore we do it. No, it's that we, through the knowledge of Christ, we gain Christ to live him, that we may live through him. He is given that we may live through him. And he becomes our life. And actually the love that we share is not our love, but his love for us and his love in us. That's what he prayed in John 17. You know, the love which you have for me may be in them and I in them. We've received not the spirit of bondage into fear, but the spirit of sonship in which we cry, Abba, Father. And Galatians 4, 6 says, Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. We, We didn't have a relationship with God. We didn't know God. How could we love him? Jesus said in Matthew No one knows the Father but the Son, and no one knows the Son except the Father and Him whom He chooses to reveal Him. Our love for God comes from God. And that's how it's supposed to be, because it's supposed to be the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. We've been brought into the union and the unity of the triune God as a fourth member called the body of Christ. And we have Christ's life. And He wants to reveal, and He's going to spend the entire eternity revealing the riches of who he is and putting himself on display in us. And as he does, and we grow in the knowledge of him, we're always going to love him more. I love him. I love him more than I ever have because I know so much more about him. But I'm not measuring that love. I recognize that love is God's love shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Spirit, which he's given to me as I rejoice in the hope of the glory. As he reveals what is waiting for those who love him, I grow in my appreciation of him and my response is to love. Not only to him, but to the brothers. But I recognize that it's not my love. So I'll never boast that I love God. Instead, I'll say I dwell in the love of God and I recognize that he loved me because while I was yet a sinner, he gave his son for me to be a propitiation for my sins. And I'll also recognize the brethren who also have that profession and love them. Um, herein is love not that we love God but that he loved us and uh, sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins beloved if God so loved I, I'll come back to you honey I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you in a minute almost done beloved if God so loved us we ought to also love one another so it's based on God's love no man has seen God at any time so in other words how could you know him how, how would you say you love him? You haven't ever even seen him. You know, it's ridiculous. Uh, but if we love one another, God dwells in us and his love is perfected in us. Again, it's not our love, it's his. Hereby we know that we dwell in him and that he in us because we love God so much. No, because he's given us his spirit. Okay, and he's, he's going to build up. Chapter 5 is all about how we know we have his spirit. And it's linked to the fact that we have the profession of faith. We believe God's record concerning his son. We believe that he's the propitiation for the sins of the world. We believe that Jesus is the Christ. And that is the evidence that we have the Spirit testifying within us. Because it is the Spirit that bears witness. But anyway, hereby we know that we dwell in him. So he's trying to assure us that we do know. So if you read this chapter and you come away thinking you don't know God, then you've missed the point if you're a believer. Because he's trying to assure you that you do. Hereby we know that we dwell in him and he in us because he's given us a spirit and we've seen and testify. See, the spirit is connected to the testimony and the knowledge of God. That the father sent the son to be the savior of the world. We've seen and testify. We have a spirit of wisdom and revelation and we've beheld him and said, he is the son of God. He is the Christ. He is the propitiation for my sins and he was given for me. He is the savior of the world, Jesus Christ. That, what is that? That is God's testimony concerning his son. How do I know I have the spirit? Right? How do I know I dwell in him? Because I have the spirit. How do I know I have the spirit? Because I've seen and testify that the father sent the son to be the savior of the world. The testimony is the evidence. Okay? 
Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him and he in God. Now, what is he defining here? He's trying to show you who are the brethren. Who, you know, you're commanded to love one another, love the brothers. Who are they? Well, they're the people that have the Spirit. Well, how do you know I have you have the Spirit? Well, test the spirits. Remember how we talked about at the beginning of the chapter? You can know the spirit of error versus the spirit of truth. How? By the testimony, by what they profess about Jesus Christ. Those who profess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in them. And they in God. How do we know that they're brothers? Because of that. And we have known and believed the love that God has to us. God is love and he... Hold on a second. Alexa, stop. Uh, and we have known and believed the love God has towards us. God is love and he that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. What? We've known and believe the love God has for us. What is that love? He sent his son. It's, that, it's the message. The message is the love. You say, I don't know if I feel God loves me. Well, that's not the point. You don't look at your feelings. You look at what you believe. Do you believe God loves you? Well, I don't know. You know, it seems like I've had a bad day. It seems like I've had some pretty hard things in my life. Well, that's not what you're supposed to look at. God commends his love for us. And that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. What does it mean that he commends? He puts it on display and says, here, look at this. This is my love. So we are instructed how to know God's love. Not to look at our feelings and our situation and, our, and, and what's here, but to look at what the God has testified concerning his son. He gave him to be my savior. And when you really realize that he's the propitiation for your sins and you really focus on that, say, ah, thank you, Jesus. You came for me that I might live through you. You're the propitiation for my sins. You've reconciled me to God and made peace. I have peace with God through my Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm welcome into the fellowship. He loves me and dwells in me. I know he dwells in me. I know his spirit is in me because I have this testimony. You know what you'll start to find? You're dwelling in the love of God. Your heart will open up, and Christ will make his home there, and you'll sense the appreciation. Whereas just a little bit ago, you might have felt cold, towards God. Just pray what you know to be true. Pray what you believe. And you will find the love of God because it's in that message of the gospel that he commends his love towards us and bears witness to it. The spirit bears witness to the gospel. So when you preach the gospel to yourself or pray gospel truths to the father, you will find your heart opening up and feelings will get there that weren't there before. Not feelings of power necessarily, not feelings of glory necessarily, but an inward rest and knowledge. I am in the love of God. Okay. We know and believe that the love God has us towards us. God is love. God is love. And he that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, is so is, uh, are we in the world. Now remember Jesus said, or John said in 1 John 2, now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, you may have confidence that it's coming. This is a second, another reference to the judgment seat, the condition he will be found in when he comes. We want our love to be perfect, right? What love? Is it our love for God? No, it is our dwelling in God's love for us through an acknowledgement of his testimony concerning his son. And that produces the fellowship, and that fellowship is the love for the brethren, <laughs> Uh, there is no fear in love. See, we can have boldness in the day of judgment versus shrinking back in shame. It's the same thing. Abide in me must be the same thing as having our love perfected. And it is because we dwell in God. Dwelling there, I'll bet you anything. Well, I can't look it up uh, because I don't have the internet. I, it, I guarantee it's the same word, maneo, as abide. The dwells, uh, God is love and he that dwells in love dwells in God. What love? God's love. Where was, it, where was it manifested? The gospel. The message is the God's commendation of his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The gospel is the message through which we believe it. And it is the testimony of God concerning his son. And it is our belief in that testimony that causes us to know we have the spirit. And it is our focus on that testimony that brings us into the sense of the love of God and helps us to abide in Christ.
because he said, if that which abides in that which you heard from the beginning abides in you, you will also continue in the Father and in the Son. Right? So when it talks about abiding in him so that you may have confidence in the day of judgment, it's talking about the message you've heard. And the message is that we should love one another. But what is that message? What is that love? I'm sorry. It's that God, it's not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave his son that we may live through him and gave his son to be a propitiation for our sins. It's the testimony. It's the gospel. It's the message we heard from the beginning. See, these are all words to say the same thing. And to dwell in God means to abide in Christ. And the way we abide in Christ is to cling to the message. And the way we abide in God is to dwell in his love. It's the same thing. The message is the love. The gospel is the love. The love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit, which he's given to you when you come into contact with that message, which is the power of God unto salvation. You meditate on gospel realities, which are all the riches of Christ available to us as an inheritance, and you'll be brought fuller into the love of God so that your love is perfected. Your love, well, no, it's not your love. It's not that we love God, it's that he loved us. And we dwell in his love. So when he says our love is being perfected, he's talking about God's love in us by our dwelling in him. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Why? Because there's no fear. Because as he is, so are we in the world. And remember, he said, uh, he who says he abides in him should walk as he walked. And I said, we think that that means be really holy and religious, you know. But what about the fact that Jesus went to parties and sinners were comfortable being with him and didn't feel rebuked? And he didn't hide in the corner because he was so religious he was afraid one of them would take his sanctification away from him. Can you interact with sinners and let them know that reconciliation is available to them? You know, and that God has paid the price and that they're forgiven, all they had to do was believe? Or do you feel the need to Make sure that they know that they're breaking the law and they're condemned. You know, that's not what Jesus did. The Pharisees did. That's why they hated him. But he was a friend of sinners. And I think this is the same thing. We love him because he first loved us. There it is again. Oh, there, I'm sorry. Because as he is, so are we in the world. Same thing. We walk as he walks. We walk in the love of God. And that frees us up. When you're free from condemnation, you're not so worried about minding all your P's and Q's. You're a little more free. You might be rougher around the edges, according to someone's sanctimonious, self-righteous, religious culture. Can't take a joke, you know. But uh, you're going to be able to relax. And that's going to be a version of you that you may have never seen before because you've been bound up in fear all your life. And it may scare your religious sensibilities because the real you might not be as refined as what you think, what your culture has told you it should be. And yet it may be perfectly fine with God. We don't know what Jesus really looked like. We know he's offensive to the religious types, though. You know, they did not like him. <laughs> anyway, we love him because he first loved us. And then we get to if a man says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. So what are we talking about? We are talking about how to recognize those who don't know God and calling them out as liars because they say they love God and yet they hate the brethren. And we know they hate the brethren because they reject the testimony of Christ. They don't dwell on the love of God because they don't keep the testimony. If they did, they'd love the brethren and recognize them. That's really what we're talking about. How do we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of error, the spirit of antichrist and the false prophets versus the true believers and the fellowship? Well, it's all by the testimony. It's by the gospel. And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff in this message about the new covenant because of the unrealistic expectations of the people who say, oh, I love God. And yet it's built on a faulty theology that it's worth investigating. Um, I know this message was strong. I had to attack it real strong because there were so many things to try to pull together. I felt overwhelmed. So sometimes what I do is I just start speaking real loud and firm and uh, something comes out. So hopefully that didn't come across as uh, too loud. All right, take care.